Hello, welcome, and thanks for joining us to help choose home when care is needed, a podcast all about the benefits, value, and safety of receiving care and services in the one place that feels most comfortable, wherever it is that the person needing care calls home. I'm your host, Marilee Orsini, and I've been involved in health care at home since 1981. Before we meet today's guest, a brief thank you to our sponsors and partners, the National Association for Home Care and Hospice, Access, and Core Cubed. Today's episode is number 14 of season four. Our guest today is Fred Johnson, president and CEO of Team Select Home Care, a company with 30 locations in 11 states. I'll let Fred talk about his in-home care business, but what first interested me in seeking out an interview is that Fred is leading the charge to reinvent the healthcare model for medically fragile children and their families. Please help me, won't you, and welcome Fred Johnson to help choose home. Okay, well, first, Fred, thank you so much for joining us today. As I mentioned earlier, the fact that the majority of your business is in pediatrics, this is an area that we've not really covered about care at home. So I'd love to start with you first telling me a bit about Team Select Home Care. Sure. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you so much for having me, too, and the opportunity to shine a bit of a light on, um, on some of the pediatric healthcare challenges we're facing right now. So Team Select, we are uh, have multiple service lines, but the majority of what we do is provide uh, skilled nursing and therapy for medically fragile children. We do that currently in 11 states and, and looking to, to continue rapid expansion. On top of that, Team Select also does some Medicare some mobile physician work, some home health and and mobile therapy work in in Colorado and Arizona as well. And you have a unique approach in some of your pediatric cases that involves family caregivers. And I think that's how I first came to know about Team Select. Would you talk to me about that and the opportunities that families have to help provide care and extend your capacities? Absolutely. Yeah, that's it's really become my passion, this this family caregiving, especially as it relates to parents and relatives of medically fragile children. So, you know, historically, you know, parents of medically fragile children experience a pretty high divorce rate. And I think that's common sense if you stop and think about the stress that parents of medically fragile children encounter on a routine basis. You know, a lot of times you're chained to your home because your child is maybe draped or vented and very difficult to move. And historically, it's been incredibly difficult for these families to consistently receive the nursing care that they are authorized to receive and entitled to receive from Medicaid. So so basically, the, the way it works is, you know, medically fragile children are, are generally defined as technology dependent children, children that historically would have received a majority of their care ongoing in a hospital or facility type setting, but with the push in technology into more care in the home where it's less expensive and and patients tend to have better outcomes in the home. There's been this nationwide push for more of these children to be cared for in the lowest cost and happiest setting, which is the home. The challenge, though, with that and and the reason so many of these medically fragile children end up or parents of these children end up in divorce and in difficult situations is there was a, a pretty bad nursing shortage before the pandemic began. And in that nursing shortage really manifested itself in a difficult way for families of medically fragile children. So basically, these parents and children rely almost entirely on Medicaid to be the payer of last resort for their home health care. And for, you know, years, in some cases, decades, those reimbursement rates that Medicaid pays home health agencies to find a nurse to, to help take care of that child at home, those rates generally have not really kept up with inflation. They haven't kept up with nursing wages. 
And it's been incredibly exacerbated by the pandemic. And so, you know, before the pandemic, it was a problem. But with the pandemic, what we've seen is hospitals paying, you know, incredibly high wages, especially for travel nurses. Sometimes we've seen $200, $250 an hour for for registered nurses to work in hospitals, Uh, huge signing bonuses. And what's happened is, you know, home health care for nurses taking care of medically fragile children is one of the lowest reimbursed services that a nurse can work in. And in most cases, agencies can pay a nurse somewhere between $23 and $30 an hour for, for this type of care, depending on what state you're in. And that's really dictated by those reimbursement rates that Medicaid pays and, and generally doesn't increase. So what's happened over the over the course of the pandemic and it's continued to worsen is more and more nurses are getting sucked out of home care and into the hospitals because they can get 500, in some cases, a thousand times higher salaries for the time being um, to do that type of work. And then what happens is these these shifts that these children are authorized for for the care of the home go unfilled because agencies can't find nurses willing to work for a uh, you know, what used to be a 20 to 40 percent discount over what they can make in a hospital and now is closer to a 70 to 90 percent discount. And what that happens then is these children end up either back in hospitals where they can be cared for until home health staffing or a nurse can be found. But obviously that's very expensive for Medicaid and it's very unfortunate for those children and their families. Or what it means is those parents or single parents have to quit their job, are unable to work outside the home because they have to stay home to keep their child alive. And that ends up driving more food stamps and welfare and essentially drives higher costs in the long run. So that kind of defines the problem. But that was a lot, Marilee. So maybe I'll pause there real quick and then I'll talk about the solution. But does the problem kind of kind of make sense there? But the problem does make sense. And I guess, you know, this, the, our consumer audience, unless they have a medically fragile child, may not be aware that there are numbers of medically fragile children around the country and also programs that cover that. Could you talk yeah. a little bit about that first before you go into solution? Like how big is the problem? And Yeah, yeah. So the the size of the problem is about a little less than 1% of the pediatric population would be deemed medically fragile. You know, on the higher acuity end, you're talking about children, you know, that that need respiratory challenges, need a a trach and a ventilator, either part-time or or full-time. On the lower acuity side, you're talking more children with maybe G and J tube for feedings, you know, extreme autism you know, epilepsy, seizure disorders. And so it kind of covers that that gamut. And so although it's only, you know, less than 1% of the pediatric population, these children account for over 40% of the total healthcare costs for children in the country. So basically what that means is a medically fragile child costs Medicaid 40 times more than a non-medically fragile child. So the whole goal with these children is, A medically fragile child that's eligible for home care, yes, they may be highly acute, but they're generally stable. If they weren't stable, they wouldn't be authorized to be cared for in the home. And the whole goal in order to keep the cost of caring for that child, in order to keep that child happy and healthy and keep their cost down, what we found through, you know, terabytes of data and experience is in order to keep a medically fragile child out of the hospital and keep their total cost down and keep them stable, they need somebody there every day to execute their care plan, to do the bowel care so they don't get an infection, to do the proper G and J tube feeding so they maintain proper nutrition, to change out the trach and do the suctioning and cleaning so that they can breathe easy. When someone's there every day, what we find is it doesn't matter if that's the best pediatrician in the country, an RN, an LPN, or a trained and qualified family member. What matters is that that child gets that care plan executed every day so that they remain stable. And what we find then is that that dramatically reduces the unplanned hospitalizations for these children. So one more statistic for you is that the the cost of home care for these children represents about 2% of the total cost of their care. 
and well over 50% is driven by hospitalizations and mostly unplanned hospitalizations. So what we find is what, what Medicaid's goal is, is to have it pay enough money so that agencies like us can be competitive to hire nurses so that every day, whether it's two hours a day, eight hours a day, or 24 hours a day, that child is getting their care plan executed every day. And when we find when that does happen, we find that their, their hospitalization rates are incredibly low and therefore their total cost of care is low or lower. But when agencies are unable, whether it's because of the pandemic, whether it's because of the disparity in pay or stagnant reimbursement rates, when there is no nurse and the, that child and that family is not getting the care that they're authorized for, that's when we see the total cost of care of those children rise sharply. And it's simply because when they don't get that care plan executed every day, when there is no nurse or there's not a trained parent or family member that knows how to keep that child stable, then that child either ends up in the hospital, what we've seen for days, weeks, months, and even years on end, unable to come home because there's lack of nurse staffing. Or what we find is a parent's trying to do it on their own without any oversight, without any training, without any tools or technology. And then that child bounces in and out of the hospital. But thankfully, we, we have what we think is a great solution to this problem. Oh, good, uh, good. <laughs> and, and it's already working in one state. It's actually already working in two states and soon to be working in a third state. And so basically, the model that we've seen work tremendously for these, for these children and these families and for, and for Medicaid is to actually leverage these, these family members. And uh, so basically what we do is in, in Colorado, there's a program and, and we call it the family CNA program or the parent CNA program. And what it allows agencies to do is we can take parents of medically fragile children and uh, home health agencies are able to, to take those parents and train them for free to become certified nursing assistants in Colorado. And if those parents complete that, that education and complete their independent certification, their test, and as well as all the requirements for you know, all their clinical hours and everything, those parents then can be hired by an agency as a certified nursing assistant and actually be paid to replace some of the lower acuity duties or items on that care plan that a nurse would have done in the past. And we can actually take a parent and assign those duties to the parent with the proper oversight from registered nurses. So basically a parent can be paid to do things such as G and J tube feedings, bowel care, bathing, uh, bed transferring, activities of daily living, tasks that we historically would pay a nurse to do, but that are very much able to be executed by a certified nursing assistant under the remote supervision of a registered nurse. And so at the end of the day, what that does is we, we free up our nurses to do work on trach and vent children and the higher acuity children. And we take the lower acuity children or the, the duties, the lower acuity duties, and we have those executed by generally by a parent who never misses a shift, never calls in sick. Every day, you know, every time that child needs the care, that parent is there to execute it. And so basically in the end, what happens is for every hour of care that we are able to, that used to be done by a nurse that can now be done by a CNA, the state of Colorado saves about 40% on every hour worked because they can naturally pay an agency less to staff a CNA for a case than a registered nurse. So we drive down that cost per hour of care. But most importantly, we also, by, by taking parents of medically fragile children, many of whom are single parents on food stamps and welfare, we are getting them off of food stamps and welfare, giving them a living wage, giving them a, a benefits package if they work more than 30 hours a week, and really helping lift them off of food stamps and welfare and giving them a job, giving them a career, giving them their, their life back, their dignity back. And then the third major area of savings is we see a massive reduction in the unplanned hospitalizations of these children. So nationally, every 30 days, the national 30-day hospitalization rate for medically fragile children is between 18 and 22%, depending which major study you read. 
But with over a thousand children over the past two years in Colorado, Team Select, for example, has had a 1.5 to 3 percent hospitalization rate for the children being cared for under this model. So basically what that means is we've reduced the unplanned hospitalization rate for these children by 90 percent or more, which saves the state of Colorado significant dollars and keeps those beds open and free for more acute children or, you know, right now, children that need some of those beds for COVID. So that's really kind of the the overview of the program and how it works. And so what we've done is, is take that program in Colorado. We've also recently discovered that this program has been operating kind of quietly, very similarly in the state of New Hampshire. And so Team Selected just made an acquisition to go and, and help expand this program even further in New Hampshire. And then we have work legislatively that's been done in Arizona to bring this program to market. We think this program will be up and operational in Arizona in early 2022. And then we have numerous other states where we've been working to try to bring this program to more and more states so we can help more and more families across the country. That is is so impressive. And Fred, you're a data analytics guy at heart, it sounds like. Yeah, a little bit, yeah. (laughs) So it seems to me that you must have used that in in some of your planning and your execution in terms of what's in the best interest, not only for the benefit of the children and their parents, but from a cost saving standpoint. Yeah, that's exactly right. You know, I think the, the challenge that we deal with is when we pitch this program, Sometimes we get the, the the folks at the state or Medicaid or the first thing they do is look at us and they're like, wait a second, you want us to pay parents for being a parent? Isn't that what they're supposed to do? And, uh, you know, we so the use of the data analytics to show them that, you know, listen, we're not paying a parent to be a parent. We're paying a parent to be a caregiver, a, a trained and certified caregiver to perform duties that we Previously, we're comfortable paying a nurse a much higher wage to do. And now all we're doing is is using parents because it's practical, because they're already there, and because it's a significant cost savings, and it dramatically increases or improves the outcomes of these children, specifically in in the reduction of the hospitalization of these children. So, you know, using data to overcome, you know, biases, and, you know, kind of really show factually how this program saves money and, and makes the world a better place for these families at the same time is, is really critical into overcoming some of the uneducated opinions or thoughts about, you know, employing parents in, in this manner. And you also are interested in innovation. Obviously, this is a very innovative program in the care at home space. And it looks like from what you're doing and what you mentioned earlier, you also are using physicians in a different way. Can you talk about that a bit? Yeah, we are. You know, we we kind of felt even before the pandemic that the house call being able to, you know, receive your primary care and then some of your specialty care in your home or, or, you know, whether you're in a senior living building, a group home, you know, wherever that home may be. And so before COVID as a, as a company, when we were looking at, you know, how healthcare can be conducted in the future, you know, we wanted to, to create or want to and are on the mission to create innovative care continuums. You know, when, when we look at some of the patients that we serve, whether they be medically fragile children or whether those be, you know, Medicare, you know, seniors over the age of 65, we, we service both those types of, of patients and then kind of everything in between. And one of the things that we felt needed to be improved in home care, but even, you know, across the healthcare industry as a whole is, is really holding, you know, agencies and healthcare providers accountable for the care and the outcomes that, that, that they deliver. But also, you know, what, what we see for medically fragile children and seniors is when you look at all the care that they receive, you find, you know, there's a nursing company trying to bill Medicare, Medicaid, as much as they can for that patient. And there's a therapy company trying to do the same thing and individual physicians doing the same thing and specialists. And none of these people are very few are talking to each other. Very few are coordinating, 
the care. They're all just trying to treat that one patient without talking to each other and without having really any outcome or data that holds them accountable for improving that care and doing it at the lowest cost. So what we're looking to do is bring back the mobile physician, but not by itself, but partner it with with other businesses so that we can treat those patients as one and we can work with Medicare, Medicaid, and other payors to population health manage patients. So a couple examples would be, you know, in the when you come to medically fragile children cared for, you know, primarily paid for by Medicaid, you know, right now they're paying, you know, home health agency, one home health agency to do the nursing, another one to do the therapy, another one for the specialty. And what we're trying to do is say, you know, how about we can be you know, we can provide physician care for these for these children and we can provide that in a mobile fashion, especially when it's so difficult to get these children into a physician's office. We also can do the, the, the nursing. We can also do the therapy. And since we know at Medicaid, these children cost Medicaid 40 times more than a non-medically fragile child, we feel that we can bundle physician services, nursing services, therapy services, maybe some personal care services and say, you know, pay us a flat amount per month and we will help you keep these. We will use all these services as well as the data analytics that we have to keep these children safe at home and out of the hospital. And we're willing to to put our money where our mouth is and, and take risk where, you know, we could earn more money if we do our job or we could be penalized if we don't. And, you know, similar things for the senior population. Instead of multiple different providers, each billing Medicare or Medicare Advantage, we're looking to bundle home health, mobile therapy, mobile physician services, eventually hospice and personal care, and and have one provider be that one throat to choke for making sure that those patients get the best outcomes at the lowest cost and build that all under one roof. So what we felt was there was really no way to treat the whole patient and be able to you know take risk and do population health management and truly reduce cost if we didn't have physicians in the mix. So really that kind of bringing mobile physicians through Team Select, we're doing it here in Phoenix and we're getting ready to expand it to Colorado and beyond is really the the final piece that we need in order to really treat those patient populations as one and, and really drive down costs and drive up outcomes in the long run. Well, it seems that because you're expanding into different states and you are making an acquisition in New Hampshire, that you are making progress in your quest to do this. Do you feel positive about the future? I do. I do. You know, I I will say that COVID has been incredibly difficult for home health agencies and, and basically any healthcare providers. And, you know, we're going on about month, you know, 22 here or so of dealing with you know, vaccination requirements, keeping our patients and our employees safe, you know, fighting a a dreadful nursing shortage. But at the same time, you know, if we can get past this pandemic and we don't see any new new variants come through that are going to cause us steps backward, I do think that whether it be, you know, programs such as this, whether it be, you know, other innovation that's been driven by the pandemic, I think In the short term, it's been difficult for providers, but I think in the long run is from a healthcare perspective, we've seen probably a decade or two worth of innovation happen in the last two years because the pandemic has forced it. So I do, I am optimistic for the long term that whether it be the hospital care or the home care, you know, we've made some incredible advancements in in how we're able to treat patients how we're able to treat more patients at home going forward at lower cost because of, you know, rise in things like telehealth or or innovative programs like using family members as caregivers. So, you know, it's a little bittersweet that it took a, a pandemic to, you know, institute or kick off, you know, big waves of innovation. But I think fast forward six to 12 months, and if we're on the back end of this pandemic, I think as a country, we'll be on a better path for our total health care and how we contain those costs and and, and treat an aging population, I think we'll we'll be in a better situation than we were had, had COVID not happened. 
Well, good. I'm going to take that positive approach. <laughs> I like yeah. that. Um, you know, I could talk to you for a long time, but we are at the end of our time here. So was there something that you thought I was going to ask you that I did not or something that you would like to say in closing? Yeah, you know, I would just say if there's people out there that are listening that are dealing with a family caregiving issue, whether that be, you know, taking care of a spouse, whether that be, you know, helping care for for aging parents or whether it be uh, parents of medically fragile children. There are resources out there. You know, there's we're very friendly with a group called um, caregiving.com. I just wanted to mention their website and, and an organization that has just tons of resources and networks and, and support for, for family caregivers. And as it relates to, to parents of medically fragile children, whether that be, you know, in New Hampshire or Arizona, where this program is either live or coming live or Colorado, where it is live, or if you are the parent of a medically fragile children in one of the 47 other states and you're struggling to receive the nursing services and the care that you're entitled to, you know, please go to the unforgottenfamilies.com. It's basically a, a nonprofit group that we started and it's not fully developed yet, but it's getting there. And we are looking to make this the Unforgotten Families a, a nonprofit that, that works on behalf of, of families and parents of medically fragile children to essentially make the world a better place for them, whether that be, you know, pushing for, for paid caregiving and, and this family CNA as an option, whether that mean pushing for rate increases so that agencies can be more competitive to, to hire nurses so that these families can get the care that they, that they need so that their child can be properly cared for and they can work outside the home. If you go to that website, there's, there's several buttons where you can click to become an advocate and we won't spam you or anything, but we will take your information. And when we are looking to push for this program in more states, that will help us partner with you and can also help you connect to us to follow along for information or, or you can help direct us to states where the problem is, is very acute. Well, thank you so very much for your time today. You know, I'm always so pleased to find people who are working in the industry and who are passionate about it and who are positive and, and really trying to make this a better, a better caregiving situation for all of us. So thank you for all you do and thank you for your time today. And I wish you the very best. Thank you so much. I really greatly appreciate the opportunity to make more people aware of, the, of this kind of hidden problem. Thank well, you so much. Hey, I hopefully, hopefully we have done that today. So I, I think so. You have a great rest of your week. Okay, Fred, and thank Thanks you again. So much. You too. Thank you so much for listening today. And a special thanks to our sponsors and partners, the National Association for Home Care and Hospice, Access, and CoreCute. If you've not done so already, please subscribe to our podcast and take the time to leave a review on Apple Podcast. We are now also on Spotify and most other places where you find podcasts. Like and follow us on social media and join us, won't you, to spread the word and help choose home when care is needed.